Good morning, and welcome back to the second day of the Living to 100 Symposium. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to thank our gold sponsors, Milliman and AARP, and our bronze sponsors, Hanoveri, Genry, and MG Consulting for their support. And I would encourage your company to support the symposium uh, in uh, three years if you can. Also, thanks to the SOA Financial Reporting Section, the Product Development Section, the Reinsurance Section, and the Committee on Life Insurance Research uh, for their help as well as the SOA Aging and Retirement Research Program and the Mortality and Longevity Research Program. Uh, those who know me know that I'm an analytics guy at heart, but as uh, Sally and Anna powerfully reminded us yesterday, we're here to serve the public's interest. And in this vein, I want to introduce Dr. Jacqueline James. She is the Director of the Center on Aging and Work and the Sloan Research Network on Aging and Work at Boston College. Dr. James is also a fellow in the Behavioral and Social Science Division of the Gerontological Society of America. Her research has focused on the meaning and experience of work, gender roles and stereotypes, adult development, perceptions of older workers, and emerging retirement issues. Today, she will share her insights on retirement security. Please help me in welcoming Dr. James. Thank you so much for that nice introduction, and thank you so much for inviting me to be here in this beautiful place, in this beautiful city, in this beautiful weather, somebody from Boston. I left snow yesterday morning, so it's really nice to be here. And I must start by saying I've been talking to many of you over the last 24 hours, and I'm so impressed with the work that you do, and I hope that we can find time at the end of this to discuss some of the ways that you are understanding these issues, as well as um, what I've been working on. Um, <clears throat> I want to advance my slide. Whoops. Okay. First, just to <clears throat> tell you a little bit about my center. Um, this is a picture of the building where I'm located. Um, we were founded in 2005 by a generous grant from the Sloan Foundation. Uh, recognizing the changing context of aging and work, we were given the um, funding to talk to employers and their employees about what they needed to do to adapt to this changing context of longevity and health and the need to work longer. We used a quality of employment framework for all of our work and we did talk to employers and their employees um, at the national and international levels. What we tried to do was to provide evidence for the kinds of action steps that people need to take to make it possible for people to work longer when they want to and need to. Right now, we do not have funding for research. The Sloan Foundation has seen fit to give me funding to build an international network of scholars to um, advance the work of our center, to bring in more people from the outside and create a network, a society, if you will, of people who are working on these issues. For the most part, people who are studying aging and work are in all different disciplines, in business, in HR, in sociology, in social work, in psychology, in anthropology, and bringing them together to talk about their various methods and what they're learning is the goal of this network. Right now I have about 260 members from all over the world and we sponsor institutes and workshops and, and um, I have a call for papers out right now. If any of you are interested in joining, it's simple. You just have to send me an email and tell me you'd like to join. Right now it's a pretty simple process. What I want to do today is a little bit um, summarize what I see as the current context of aging, work, and retirement. Um, I'm going to talk about retirement security, which most of us think about as financial security. But my part today is to talk about the need to go beyond financial security and talk about the kind of security that we need to live fully and well throughout these 100 years that you are 
you've come here to think about and talk about. In other words, we need to think about longevity planning, and I'm going to give you some ideas about some new norms and expectations about that. And again, I hope to have plenty of time for discussion at the end. I don't have to tell you that the um, U.S. is aging, that, that um, people are living longer than ever before. Um, 15 to 18 years have been added to life expectancy, and for some people that's a lot more, and some it's, of course, less. Um, we don't even know what's old anymore. If you ask people what's old, they, they'll often say, well, maybe 80. And if you ask people in their 80s, what do they say? 90. <laughs> and last year I did one of those flash things in my class where I asked my class where um, one of those polls that you do on your phone, when do you think you'll be old? And one person said 30. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so it's relative when we're going to be old. Um, pictured here is my mother. She celebrated her 100th birthday two years ago. And she's not doing as well now as she was then, but she's still looking to my brother and me for signs of maturity. So she's, she's still being a mother. Um, and she's one of many. At her birthday party, I actually said, I know you all think all the 100 people that were there, uh, I know you all think this is unusual to be celebrating a 100th birthday, but it really isn't. Because the number of centenarians has grown from a few thousand in the 1950s to over 340,000 worldwide today. And the greatest concentration of these are in the U.S. and in Japan. In the U.S. right now, there are 75,000 centenarians. There are a lot of people in my mother's age. And that number is expected to grow to 600,000 um, by mid-century. So centenarians are here, and living to 100 years is not an unrealistic expectation for a lot of people. And we know that the economy has affected the plans of the retirement age of the retirement um, eligible, so there's a lot going on in terms of what, how people think about when and how and what they should do in retirement. There is a concern about both financial and psychological security. So here's the thing about that, though. Retirement may be the wrong word for what happens after the end of the big career, because most of the experts that I read and the work that I do suggest that retirement, later life, takes a little bit of work, some sense of what constitutes work. This very popular book, Successful Aging, written by Rowan Kahn, said that after a certain age, how we live our lives, our lifestyle, matters more than genes for how it is that we age. They say that we need to do things to, 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 to avoid um, disability and disease. And that means the things that we all know well. Eat, eat the right foods, don't smoke, um, don't drink too much, get some exercise. Um, it also means, they also talk about developing cognitive function in later life and working at that, not just letting it happen. Um, and we used to think that this means things like doing crossword puzzles and, you know, word games. But we're finding that it doesn't mean that. It means taking on challenging activities, things like learning technology, which I think all of us older people can do, learning a new language, um, getting in social situations with people that we disagree with. These are the kinds, kinds of things that enhance cognitive function. And then these authors say that we need to make sure that we stay engaged with life. Others say that this work needs to be some kind, something that is, continues to be productive, and that means something that produces goods and services, whether they're paid or not, um, in later life. Something that we're committed to, that people expect to see us, that we, we can't just say, I can't come today. We need to be involved in some activities where we are wanted and needed and expected to contribute. Um, these authors talk about it in terms of work, paid work and unpaid work, volunteering and caregiving. And this is another theory that says that that work needs to be something that we've always wanted to do. 
Um, he says that there are four stages of life. There's, there's the education, there's work, and then there's this other stage after raising a family and working that he calls the third age. And in a book that I wrote a few years ago, we define third age as age 65 to 79, when people are still usually healthy and well enough to do most anything that they want to. And he calls this the best time of life, the time to realize long-held dreams, the crown of life. And this was indeed the title of the book that we wrote, The Crown of Life. Um, and pictured here are some examples of that that were featured in um, AARP magazine a few years ago. These are all people who had career jobs, who retired, and started doing something they'd always wanted to do. One is a mystery, mystery writer, one's an actress, one's an artist, one's a porter, portraitist. Um, and this person on the right here, his name is Daddy Mac Orr. He ran an auto mechanic shop for his career job. And when he started thinking that it was time to hang that up, he started taking guitar lessons. He'd always wanted to learn to play the guitar. So he started taking guitar lessons. People said he took it everywhere he went. He learned to play the guitar. And when he finally did retire, he was actually pretty good at the guitar, and he started playing in the jazz scene in New Orleans. And according to this article, he was a big hit and, and was playing gigs all over New Orleans. So these are examples of people who did find something later in life that was very different than what they had done before, but um, something they had always wanted to do. So all of these perspectives in one way or another suggest um, ways to grapple with these added years of life um, and how to make the most of them by accentuating the positive and, and, and ignoring the negative. Um, here you can see um, Charlie Brown says to Snoopy, we only live once, Snoopy. And Snoopy says, no, we only die once. We live every day. And how we live is really important according to all these theories. But you know, I go places where people say, wait a second, all this positive stuff about aging is really problematic. Um, just as negative attitudes about aging can be debilitating and, and depressing and, and keep us from doing the kinds of things we want to do, positive ones can have no negative effects too. Um, critics say that this business about successful aging is really just not aging. And it's also a way of sort of blaming the victim to say that if you're not doing so well, if you are facing physical challenges, or you are going downhill sooner than you expected, that it's all your fault. Um, and this has led some people to suggest, as, as indicated in this cartoon, that we don't need Social Security because people can just, you know, adjust their lifestyle and they don't need all these supports that we have created for older adults. So I always like to stop here and say that we need to straddle this fence between old ideas about aging being all negative and downhill and new ones making us think that we can jump out of airplanes at 90 like President Bush did. So I want to shift gears and talk about the new context of work. The, the way that um, people are working today is one of the most visible changes in the experience of aging. Um, according to this recent Transamerica survey, 51% of the people surveyed said they expect to work past age 65. 54% plan to work after retirement. And the reason for this is mostly financial. Every survey asks people, you know, and it's not just making money for now, but getting health benefits. It's making ends meet. It's, it's overcoming losses that were due to the, the recession. Um, it's keeping health insurance. These are a lot of the reasons people talk about it. But equally important are the other reasons people say, which have to do with staying active or involved in, in later life. Um, and a lot of people, by the time they reach age 60, 65, they've gotten themselves into a job that they really enjoy. People like working when they have jobs that they enjoy and they, they want to keep 
working. We live in a work-identified culture, and a lot of self-esteem and identity is derived from what we do for our work. And I think that's another reason why we need some idea of work in the retirement years as well as the leisure that we've come to expect. Another thing that work does is, you know, gives people a structure. I talk to people who say, if I retired, I don't know what I would do because I don't have that many things that I can think of that I could do to fill the 60 hours a week that would replace work. Um, as I said, people are identified with their work and they have social connections at work that they lose if they quit. So all of these things, including the self-esteem that's derived from work, are benefits of continued work. Here's the bad side. That slide also showed that 15% of those surveyed said they never plan to retire. And I know that you know better than anyone else that that's not a good strategy for thinking ahead about later life. Um, only 27% of people over the age of 65 have actually been able to work to the extent that they plan to. Things happen. People get sick on their own. Somebody in their family gets sick. I have my 102-year-old mother, my own children, and three grandchildren. There's always some ball in the air around that. Um, all of these things affect people's ability to con continue working. And then there's the job market. It changes. Jobs disappear. Companies disappear. Companies restructure and jobs um, go away. So the exigencies of later life work are difficult and it's really not a good strategy to think in terms of never retiring. In fact, by age 75, most people are no longer working. So the question is, should people work? And I've already talked a little bit about the kinds of things that um, work does provide for people. Even a bad job does add financial security and perhaps health insurance for people who need it. Um, it also does increase what people are going to get from Social Security, um, from the delayed um, credit, delayed retirement rec um, credit. Um, it also allows them to keep building assets and instead of depleting assets during the years that they would be working. And we have seen in our work that um, people who continue work do have better health and better well-being, although this might be a little factor of people who are healthy continuing work. <laughs> so my colleagues at the center, Kevin Cahill and Joe Quinn, paint the picture this way, that people do gradually um, reduce their hours of work over time. Um, they use the health and retirement study, which most of you probably know about. It's a study of people aged 51 to 61 that's been followed every two years for about 20 years now. And um, what they show is there are a lot of unemployment spells and working spells after age 60, after age 55, actually. So people do retire, and two years later they find another job. It might be in their own field, or it might be a completely different field. They call these bridge jobs. They might phase into retirement over time by reducing their hours. They might reduce responsibilities to part-time. And this goes on and on. They said that people, people work two years and retire. They, they, re, they stay retired a couple years. They find another job. This happens over and over again. There are many spells of in and out of the workplace between the ages of 55 and 75. And this is the good news that I have to say, is that employers are starting to recognize this. This is, again, another um, Transamerica's a survey that surveyed employers and employees recently and found that 41% of employers do know that people need to continue working and plan to work past age 65. So it's no longer this, what, you're going to keep working past, I thought everybody was on their way out the door. Employers are starting to realize that this is the new context. Um, the bad news is the employees say that they do not provide the kinds of um, programs and policies that help them with this later life need to work, but also the need for more flexibility for those caregiving responsibilities, for those going to the doctor trips that everybody has. 
Um, very few employers do have a systematic phased retirement program. Very few employers implement flexible work arrangements in systematic and fair ways. Very few employers do have ways for people to step down to part-time positions or even different roles within the organization. So these are the kinds of things that we heard from employees that they need in order to work longer. Um, and these are the kinds of things that employers are reluctant to provide. And it's really hard to understand why because none of these things are very costly to them. They take some time and effort. But it's just like the old attitude about flexible work arrangements. It's a matter of giving up control and making it, um, and, and a fear of not being able to run the business. Um, we did a randomized control stock trial a few years ago in a hospital system which we we actually implemented a flexible work arrangement policy for all levels of hospital employees. We did not allow all the same flexible work arrangements for all the employees. Obviously, nurses have to be at the bedside. But they did have options of working shorter hours, of having more control over when they worked. Um, and we saw positive business outcomes on the basis that we saw people change their um, retirement expectations to work longer because they had these options. Um, and we published a lot of these papers. And so it's our job and everybody's job to convince employers that this can be done, it can be done well, and it benefits both employers and their employees. So here's the, the summary. Um, the trend toward early retirement began in the 80s and shows no, t no signs of re reversing. People really are working longer, and when they can, they usually do. The problem is there aren't that many opportunities, um, and as I said, the exigencies of later life intervene. Um, a lot of people can't work longer. There still are physically demanding jobs that people cannot keep doing as they get older. And critics tell us in, in this context of talking about working longer that it's inspiring governments to say, well, if everybody needs to work longer and wants to work longer, then we just need to raise the normal retirement age for everybody. Well, that's not a very good idea because, as I said, employers have not adapted and there are still jobs that people can't get. When people get unemployed, they can't get back in. It's very difficult to get back in at a certain age. So we have argued, um, we've tried to, again, talk about the positives of continuing to work, try to help people figure out how to continue work if they want to need to, work with employers to help them overcome challenges to that. And, um, but we do not recommend raising the retirement age at this point. So, as pointed out by this Laslett, who wrote that book, A Fresh Map, Map of Life, a new life stage has been added, and, and I called it the third age. It's been called many things. A new life stage has also been added at the beginning, in the 20s. You know, people used to get married and have start having kids in their 20s, even earlier. And now, people, the average age of um, marriage is much later. The average age of childbirth is much later. So there's an there's an added stage of life at the beginning of the working life stage, uh, which is called emerging adulthood by a lot of people. And some of you might have children in that stage, I don't know. Um, but there are two new life stage stages added, and I'm going to talk in a few minutes about what this means, that the arc of life has changed altogether. Um, yet, and because everything is changing so rapidly, a lot of people do not feel secure in the realization or in the knowledge that they can retire, that they can finance and live well and fully for all these years, for 100 years. So there's a lot of anxiety and insecurity that goes with all this change, and that's what we have been trying to grapple with in my work. So before I get to what we've done about this, um, I went to the literature to say, you know, well, are retirees happy? And if you look at cross-sectional studies where we, you know, compare people by age group, these studies show that life satisfaction and other indicators of well-being do increase with age. 
um, and positive affect increases and negative affect decreases. But longitudinal studies, where we study the same person over time, shows that there's sort of an arc of life satisfaction, so that in the 20s, it's low. Those young people that I was just talking about are struggling because there's not a map, there's not a road map for that, for that new stage of life. They've been, up until that point, they've been told where to go, go to school, do this. The map has been made for them. They get to their 20s and it's open season and there's no, no, no pathways that um, are clearly marked for them. So there's anxiety there. And there's anxiety in this later stage, too, where people are still healthy and well and not sure what to do with all this time. Does increased leisure um, increase satisfaction? We do find more happiness and satisfaction with leisure if the leisure activities that people are involved in are social in nature. Um, we also know that people who learn how to play in life do better in later life because that is one of the aspects of retirement that we've come to expect. Um, people who've over-specialized and over-identified in work and have not developed um, you know, avenues for play or activities or commitments in their communities that they can dig into when they have more time have a harder time. George Valiant said, um, <laughs> knowing how to play helps people maintain their self-esteem while giving up self-importance. I thought that was a very interesting thought. Um, a very recent study of uh, 1,000 nationally representative sample of, of older adults, I think 51 to 66, um, showed that leisure is correlated with happiness, with a sense of freedom, with positive relationships, and a focus on fun and satisfaction. Those are all the things we expect from retirement. But that same study also found that it's been associated with negative relationships, with a loss of status, with a loss of that self-importance that I just mentioned, and feelings of boredom, of isolation, and being directionless. And another study, these are colleagues um, in Europe, have said that, that their research shows that the gains, um, the, the, the losses in retirement outweigh the gains. So it's a little bit complicated. It depends on who you ask, what kinds of jobs people had, and, and how they're doing in retirement. Um, we have argued that um, while expanded leisure is still very much sought after and pleasant um, bonus during the end of your life, a, re a reliance on leisure and social relationships alone um, might be likened to over-relying on social security for financial security. Um, we have argued that thinking of retirement as a permanent vacation is just not a good idea. Back to this idea that retirement itself may be the wrong word, that later life activity needs to be thought of as something that we're actively engaged in, resembling work, if not work, um, and that this is what helps us to, to live um, productively and well in later life. So, Again, I've been talking about all this positive stuff, and I just, I don't have to tell you again that the, the old context is still very much with us, no matter how many sexy and attractive people they put on the front of um, AARP magazine. I think it's um, Annette Benning this month. Aging is still seen as going downhill with frailty. Um, we still see older people as dependent. Anybody over 65, in fact, is defined as dependent even if they aren't. Um, and there's still in the newspapers every day some aspect of older, the numbers of older people growing and, and becoming a burden on society. We still have with us this idea that it's adaptive to disengage in later life, to narrow that circle, to phase out, to disengage, to pull in, to, to close out um, those activities and things that we've been involved with. In the 80s and 90s, this was a very popular theory that it was actually psychologically healthy to do this. And most of the research has shown that not to be true. Um, but there was this idea of disengagement in which retirement is a time of rolelessness, a time when we don't have a role to play. And we have argued that, and this is what we have argued, that people still need to think they have a role to play, even as they age. 
It's not um, hard to find evidence of this old context. You know, we see it in our workplaces. When you interview people in workplaces, they all talk about um, so many, large majority of people in, in anonymous surveys say that they feel discriminated against on the basis of age. We see it in the streets, we see it um, in our communities where we hear words like greedy geezer and there's a new one now. What's the new one? Okay, boomer. Do you know what that means? <laughs> we also see it in crossword puzzles. And this one is, um, the clue is no longer active, and the answer is retired. And this one is preparing to retire, the clue, and the answer is packing it up. And this one is, what's your retirement destination? <laughs> And there's another one that I didn't put up here, and it's a process that everyone wants to avoid, and it's five letters. What is it? What? Nope. Aging, of course. I took, I took that to my students. I said, it's, it's um, a process everyone wants to avoid, and they said death, you know, all these words. They did not mention aging. So we still have with us this um, old problem of Ageism, and the problem is, um, it's the worst ism. In this test of implicit bias, most of you probably have seen that. Um, it, my friend at Harvard um, says that this is the biggest ism there is, that the scores for ageism are the highest of any scores on her implicit bias test. If you haven't taken it and you think you could beat the test, I don't think you can, because <laughs> it's hard to do. She studies bias against age, gender, sexual orientation, and race. Um, and she, she says that even old people themselves are ageist. And we know that to be true as well. So we have to get past these ideas like this one, which is the old context of retirement. This guy says, my wife said, what you doing today? And I said, nothing. And she said, you did that yesterday. And I said, I wasn't finished. <laughs> so I want to shift gears now and talk a little bit about how um, the importance of financial security and the importance of psychological security, which is what I'm here to talk about. I know I'm wading into your territory here. so. Bear with me, <laughs> but um, this is uh, the Center for Retirement Research at Boston College just published this issue brief a few uh, weeks ago um, on the basis of a um, National Retirement Risk Index in which they show that over 50% of the population is at risk for not having enough money in retirement to replace pre-retirement -pre income. And they recommend that of course people need to save more. But they say that even saving more isn't going to take care of the problem very much. That in order to reduce it by even half, to make it only 25% of people who are at risk, it's going to take people working at least two years longer than they expect to, and saving more. And this is just another illustration of that same thing. The Economist just last week said that the system is flawed if most people don't have enough money in retirement. Here, um, 20 something like people 51 to 56, I can't get the ages, but anyway, they only have 21K in their um, IRA or um, savings account. And you can see that earlier, uh, in 2007, people had more. So people have less now than they did a few years ago. And these authors argue that it, the, the system is flawed, and I think you know that better than I do, that people don't understand 401ks, they don't know how to manage them, and they are very confused, have gotten caught up in this transition between the employer being responsible for retirement and then they're, they're being responsible themselves. So financial security is hard enough to realize. Um, but there are guidelines, and you are among the people developing guidelines for financial security. There are very few guidelines that are put out there uh, for, for the kind of 
psychological security that I'm talking about. Um, the desire to stay engaged, to continue to contribute to society and feel a sense of belonging in later life is what we have defined in a recent paper as psychological security. So um, a lot of the early research suggested that in order to have this kind of security, what people need to do is just stay busy. Just get out there, just do stuff. You know, Nike, just do it. Um, and in fact, we started looking at that. Is staying busy a factor? And what we see is people are reading and doing, re relaxing and doing the kinds of things we do hear about. But look at this, they're w watching TV four and a half hours a day. And that's probably an underestimate. And here's another one um, of the kinds of activities people are involved in. So we, we decided we didn't know what the quality of these experiences were and the extent to which these experiences do help people with better mental health and even physical health. So um, we decided to do a study. And we knew we were on new territory because we couldn't find anybody. We could find studies that asked people what they were doing, like these time surveys. We, asked, we found studies that asked people what roles they were playing. There was one study that asked people about eight different roles. Are you involved in this role, this role, this role? But none of the studies asked people about the quality of those experiences at all. Are you satisfied with it? Do you like it? Is it fun? Um, are you engaged in it? So we decided to do a study of engagement. And a lot of people say involvement and engagement mean the same thing, but we don't. Involvement is just doing something. And engagement is, is having a positive work-related state of mind characterized by being energized by it, dedicated to it, and absorbed in it. Um, we. We knew we were on new ground again, so we decided to do a pilot study. We collected a convenient sample of BC alums mostly. We expected to get 100 or 200 people, and we got wide cooperation, over 700 people. Um, and we thought this was an indication of how much interest there is in this subject. It was largely females. It was mostly BC grads. It was mostly white, so it was a very, um, not a very representative sample, but we did learn some things from it. Um, we assessed engagement in those four productive roles that we talked about. Employee, people who are still working, volunteering, caregiving, and there was a student role um, for people that were taking courses or engaged in learning a new language, which I mentioned earlier. And this shows what people were involved in. You can see that involvement with work goes down over time over age, and, um, but even at age 65, over 30% of this sample was still working. There was also heavy involvement in volunteering here and heavy involvement in caregiving, both of parents, of children, and grandchildren. And the, the volunteer percentages here are unusual. Um, most older adults are not volunteering at this level. In fact, it's mostly being done by, by 40, 30 and 40 year olds. And this is mostly related to school volunteering. This is unusual because it is a BC sample, and BC puts a lot of emphasis on um, community service. So this is how we thought about it. You could be not involved in volunteering or caregiving at all, or any of these roles. But for each role, we said, if you're involved, are you low engaged, medium engaged, or high engaged? And what we found is that high engagement predicts greater outcomes of well-being compared to not being involved at all, and low engagement predicts lower. But as we age, we found an interaction such that it's better to not be involved in something than it is to be involved and not really engaged in it. Um, this again is my mother. And she... This, this was, we had gone to celebrate her 80th birthday this time, and my husband was mowing the grass, and he wasn't doing it to her satisfaction. <laughs> so I just had to show you that. Um, we draw from this that it's really important to help people think about, as they think about financial planning, lifestyle planning, and start to engage in things, to try things. 
um, even before retirement, so that when that time comes, they have a path to where they want to be. At least the knowledge and ability to try things, to get engaged in different things. So this is how we do think about what um, psychological security is in retirement, the need to belong. Um, and this, in perhaps the reason this is so difficult to get is because there are a lot of self-help books out there talking about it. They don't talk about engagement the same way we do. They talk about meaningful, meaning, meaning, finding meaning and purpose in later life. So I went to see what meaning and purpose, what, how many people get meaning and purpose. And there was a big meta-analysis published in the American Psychologist a few years ago that examined all the studies that had um, looked at the extent to which people report meaningful lives. And they found that Americans, 90% of Americans report that they have incredible meaningful lives. So I thought, well, that's interesting because, you know, I don't see that in the mental health data. It doesn't seem to compute. I have been thinking that engagement predicts mental health, and if meaningfulness is part of that, then I must be wrong somehow. These um, findings held true in older adults that they have meaningful lives, even when they're frail and have physical dif di dis disabilities. But um, what kind of purpose? What kind of meaning? Um, these authors said that that study that I mentioned a minute ago of 1,000 people, they asked people what, they, what their important roles in life were, and they asked them how meaningful they were, but they also asked them whether the meaning was beyond the self, which they defined as significant ongoing commitment to and regular active work toward goals that are meaning to the self and also aim to contribute to society. And only 31% of the sample manifested that kind of purpose. Is that low to you or high? Well, even, even, it, um, even if it is low or high, it seems to me it leaves room for a lot of us to do more work to make it possible for more people to have that experience. Uh, it was important in this study to note that in so much of our work about volunteering and work and education, that education matters and makes a difference. It didn't make a difference in this study. And women in general and African Americans uh, in particular were more likely to have this kind of purpose. And this kind of purpose was associated with well-being as well as with satisfaction, with wisdom, with gratitude and empathy. Um, those with purpose said it is a time to have an impact on an issue of the world that I care about, to reflect, to be mindful and nurture compassion for broader humanity, to use my skills and experience to help others, to spend more time with my family. But it's also time for those things that we expect in retirement, to do for myself, to do fun things, and to keep working. So here is um, the present day uh, context of retirement security. Um, most people are not completely uh, reinventing themselves in retirement. They are using well-honed skills over the life course to adapt to retirement and structure their days. Most people in retirement are pretty happy and doing great and, and, and reporting meaning and purpose. Um, the rising retirement ages and, and longer working lives is definitely a change from the past. And there still may be too much passing the time away with watching TV. This is one of the things that is definitely a negative for well-being. And as I mentioned, whether the 30% that we saw in that study is a lot or a few, we need to help more people have these kinds of experiences. So we need to create a world in which there are more opportunities for people to have this quality of life in later life. Right now, there are not enough people thinking about how to grease the wheels and make this possible for more people. So we need to think more about in um, longevity planning. We need to in incentivize employers to, to, um, to consistently and fairly and systematically implement flexible work arrangements. Um, we need to think more about phased retirement. 
and special project work. Some employees that I know are um, providing um, special project work for retirees. Um, we need to support legislation that reduces tension between caring for a family member and paid work. And we need to leverage the workplace as a place for health promotion. A lot of employers are doing more of that. And we need to develop community-based organizations to see the, the, the good fit between the people who are out there retired who'd like to do something to help them and their need for help. The needs for help out there are vast. Um, I'm on the advisory board for a study in Singapore, and Singapore is a little bit ahead of us in all of this. Um, I just wanted to tell you that they are spending $3 billion to support lifelong learning, employability, wellness, financial literacy, and multi-generational housing. They're requiring employers to re-employ people who want to work till age 70. They're giving businesses a credit to offset the wages of employees. A lot of people don't want to hire older workers because they say they're more expensive. They're giving grants to employers so that they can modify their workplaces for older adults. Um, they're providing wellness programs. They're offering post-secondary education to people of all ages who can take courses alongside younger people. They're developing a skills future program and they're developing a money sense program that ed educates the old and the young about how to manage money and invest for later life. I think this is a pretty dramatic example of when people take seriously what's going on in the changing context of aging and work, what can happen. So my friend at um, Stanford University says that we need a new picture of life. This is the old picture in which, you know, like Laszlo said, there's education, there's work, and then there's this huge glob of leisure. And what Laura Carstensen argues is that we need to um, continue education throughout the lifespan, not just in one lump in the early part of life. We need to work less during the work and family years and more in the, in the years that we've come to expect leisure. We need more leisure in the work and family years and less in the later life years. And she says this is, um, she's actually just hosted a meeting in um, Bellagio, Italy, um, to talk about how to work with um, colleagues and policymakers to start thinking differently about the way the arc of life is viewed. So longer lives are not the problem. The problem is living in cultures designed for lives half as long as ours. Retirements that span four decades are unattainable for most individuals and government. It's nearly impossible for most people to save enough money over 40 years of work to live 40 years after that comfortably. Um, and so, um, and, and as I just pointed out, education that ends in the early 20s is ill-suited for longer working lives because everything's changing today. Um, intergenerational responsibilities are changing, um, and a long life is a gift, but this article in the New York Times recently was about how, whether or not we'll be able to be grateful for it because we haven't planned for it. So I want to leave you with a few examples of retirement security. Um, have any of you seen the Young at Heart chorus? Yes? No? It's, um, it's a really great story. Um, <clears throat> a man in western Massachusetts um, got laid off in his 50s. And he didn't have a job, so he was doing what people do. He was going to cocktail parties and he was saying, I'm out of work and, you know, I need to find a job. And so this woman says to him, um, well, I need a maitre d' at the nursing home. He said, good, I'll do that. So he went to the nursing home, and he saw all these older people coming for meals and sitting around doing nothing. And he put up a sign. He was a music teacher. He put up a sign that said, come to room 205 at 6 o'clock. We're going to do some singing. So 25 people showed up. And he started teaching these older people, with all of whom had frailties, in nursing home, to sing rock music. Not row, row, row your boat, but rock music. 
And there's a documentary about it. I recommend it. You should go and get it. Um, it's very heartwarming. But this is the thing. He doesn't treat them like old people. He even at, The documentary shows him at one of the sessions saying something like, um, you know, we expect Ben to pass a um, kidney stone any minute. And it's just a fact of life. On one of their trips, they, they go on road tours and sing in prisons. The prisoners talk about um, being touched by it like nothing they've ever seen before. And these people are having a really good time. And this man has incredible retirement security. And so do the people that are singing. Um, this is a story that appeared in the Boston Globe just last week. It's a man in Framingham, Massachusetts, who um, is a former math teacher. And um, he found that this particular school in Framingham in the poorest neighborhood, the kids were hanging around with nothing to do in the afternoon. So he started this program called Hoops for Homework. Um, and he literally goes around town raising money. He was able to get $81,000 from town meeting to get it started. He hired a social service agency to, to do it. The kids come, they play, there's food there, there's healthy food there. They are sent bags home with bags of food um, and they are helped with their homework and they, they play basketball. Um, after nearly going under the social service agency that he hired to do it didn't work out the first year. So he had to get a whole new crew in there. He didn't give up. He's still fundraising. Recently he's been able to get this um, considered an after school subsidized program by the state. So there is at least some um, promise of sustainability of this program. This man has retirement security and he's adding greatly to his community. And this one is a friend of mine. Her name is Suzanne Rowe and um, she uh, um, and her husband are in their 70s, he's 80 now. Um, he's older than she is so when he retired, he, when he got 65, he said, I'm retiring. And they were talking to me like, don't you think he should work longer? I mean, this is awful. I mean, she didn't want him to retire. He didn't really have the money to retire. All he had was Social Security. And he said, I'm going to retire and play golf. That's what I want to do. So he retired and he played golf. And I mean, he played golf. He played golf every day. And he got good at golf and he won tournaments. And he played with exciting people. And so this drove her crazy because she's one of those people that thinks you should always be giving back. And so he, um, so she lured him to Tanzania um, to go on a safari. And on the way there, they visited a little village in Nishupu. And they came across an orphanage of nine AIDS orphans um, that were being taken care of by a Christian couple who didn't have children of their own. And these people had no, no food. They had two beds for these nine children. It was just a dire situation. And they just couldn't stop. They went to the market, they got beans and rice and corn, and they delivered food. And that was the beginning of an investment in this little village. And since then, they have built an orphanage that has a school within it. They have built a village elementary school. They're in the process of building a secondary school. Um, and this has become this man's life. In fact, he's more into it than she. He's there nine or ten months a year in Tanzania. And she's written this book about it, and you can get it on Amazon. It's a really good read about how you, it's, it's not a um, um, wild-eyed view. It was very complex entering this culture and dealing with all of the exigencies of that. Um, so. Some of these are just happenstance. Some are people looking for something, and some of them have mapped it out and thought about it ahead. There are many pathways to this kind of security. So when people find that thing that they love to do, that they're good at, that the world needs, that sweet spot that they're passionate about, um, it might be that they're paid for it, 
um, the impact can be profound. It, if people are involved at this level in later life, it prevents dependence on families and communities and societies. It promotes economic and social health. It promotes well-being and meaning and purpose. Um, it even can slow age-related decline and disability. So I think I'll leave you with that and hope that we can talk about all this more with your questions. If you have any questions for Dr. James, please come to the microphone. Thank you. There's time for a few questions. Thank you very much, Les Lohman. You remind me, I, I love tautologies. And, uh, you loved what? Tautologies. Oh. Like things that are absolutely correct. <laughs> and I'm not always that way, but I am arrogant. But in any event, you reminded me of a, a tautology, which is when you reach that point of decrepancy where someone else has to take care of you, you don't like it. It doesn't matter whether you're paying for it or someone else is. Run out of money before then. Mm. And, uh, you know, I think that our own arrogance gets in the way of our uh, compassion in that... Uh, we assume that uh, seniors, people such as myself and this fine young woman coming up to also say something, uh, that we know what seniors are wanting, what they're thinking about, and things of that nature. We tend to cast our ideas about them into our own cultural and, and strategic, if you will, frameworks. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's very healthy. Mm -hmm. I, I think we need to try to... Need a new vision. Well, yeah. Uh, years ago, we got all concerned about the cost of health care. You know, old people are spending too much money on health care. And I observed that, you know, young people are concerned about relationships, middle-aged people are concerned about parenting and developing their careers. And we tend to spend our resources on the things that we're concerned about. Old people are concerned about their health. You know, I have reached that point myself, mm -hmm. changing my diet, trying to exercise, mm -hmm. uh, trying to see all three of you. <laughs> uh, so in any, in any event, these discussions I think are really important, but I think we need to stop being arrogant. I think we need to really ask the questions of the people we wish to help to find out how they want to be helped mm -hmm. and stop trying to pretend that we know better than they mm -hmm. do. So thanks. Thank you. Anna Rappaport, I, I first want to thank uh, the organizing committee for inviting Dr. Jane. So pleased we've had this topic on the program. It adds a new dimension to the Living to 100 series and a very important one. Uh, and I'd also like to encourage all of us to share our stories and collect information. Uh, one of the things I've observed, and maybe Dr. James can comment on it, is that people that want to find new paths, uh, it's not like career planning when you're in your younger years. There's no organized place to look. It's like, okay, I'm ready to do something different. What am I going to do? Uh, and you look around you and you try to find friends to talk to, but um, there's, we've yet to organize well-rounded, well-rounded defined paths. So I think by sharing with each other, we could add to that. And I hope maybe Dr. James has some suggestions. Do you want me to, well, there, there aren't nearly enough, which is what I kept pointing out, but there are places people can go. Um, I know you had Tim Driver here last year, who too talks about connecting older adults with jobs and community activities, and there's Encore.org, when people don't know about that. Um, there's a website that you can go to, um, discovering what's next. There are organizations trying to help people, but there aren't enough of them. Yes. 
Um, I said, Bilik, Canada, um, thank you very much for a very good presentation. And I have the following question. Um, there's a lot of discussion about the emerging of gig economy platform work. So do you observe that um, people on the transition into retirement are get more involved in this type of activities? Yes, we are seeing a lot more of that. Yeah. Are, there, are you aware of any studies which, uh, or surveys that uh, put numbers on the... Um, you know, I don't know of one, but I know there are studies. Um, my colleague at the center is studying self-employment in older adults, and some of that is in there. And he, his his papers. His name is Cal Halverson, okay. and if you Google him, he 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 has written some about that. I think. Thank you. Yeah, I think it is important. I mean, every time I get in a cab to go somewhere, it's a retired somebody who's um, driving a cab. Yeah. Thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. Um, Roland Rau from Rostock University and the Max Planck Institute. As a non-native speaker, I just didn't understand one thing you wrote or you said. If you know how to play and put the play into quotation marks, and maybe as a non-native speaker, I'm the only one who didn't understand what it means. But oh. <laughs> sooner or later, I also age, and I would love to know how to play. So, Thank you for asking. Um, that's a very good question. Knowing how to play, meaning knowing how to do something in leisure that's fun, that's, you know, like playing golf, like um, playing games, any kind of play. Yeah. R Roland, feel free to talk to me after that. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of people don't know how. Yes. Doug Andrews, University of Waterloo. I enjoyed your talk, and it makes us feel really good, um, but it has a, a model based on where we've come from and now we're moving on and if we could improve these things psychologically then we'd have a much better time of it. And whenever we deal with a model, the question is what happens if the model changes dramatically and it <laughs> seems like there are lots of things that are happening that are going to make the model change. So for example, when you talked about the third age, one of the descriptors was, you know, after you've finished with child bearing, but children are coming back because job security is much less now for young people than it used to be, mm -hmm. and there's more need mm -hmm. for support. Um, I mean, one it used to be when we came to talk about these things that aging was the number one issue on the agenda. Now climate change is. How is climate change going to disrupt all of those jobs? We talk, you talked about you know, living to over 100 being a norm. That's probably, or not a norm, but increasingly common. We're having trouble moving the retirement age up that's a long period in the interim. And the jobs that have been disappearing and the people who leave the workforce at 65 tend to be people that are doing physical labor because mm -hmm. they can't manage. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of physical labor to be done in that period. Who's going to provide those mm -hmm. jobs? Yeah. Probably not the 80 and 90-year-olds right. no. and so on. So yeah. there's a lot of disruptors that are coming you know, how's that going to affect the model? I mean, I mean flexible work is a no-brainer, but you and I have been advocating that for 30 or 40 years, and we're not much further ahead with all the other disruptions taking place. Yeah. How likely are we to get it? Mm -hmm. So there are challenges to the model that you're Definitely. using. Definitely. <laughs> uh, Anna Rappaport again. I I wanted to add to the discussion for people that are not aware that in the Society of Actuaries uh, 2019 Risks and Process of Retirement Survey, we had actually two sections of the survey that kind of linked to this topic. Uh, we've had questions all along about when people retire, when they expect to retire, when they actually retire, and uh, just like Dr. James said, they expect to work longer than they actually do, and uh, more people want to work and say they want to work in retirement than they actually do. We've expanded that section a little bit more to find out what some of the people are doing. And in addition to that, 
We had a section this year on disruption of employment at older ages, and we wanted to learn about people who had had a work interruption prior to reaching retirement age and their effect on retirement security, and it does indeed have an effect. Uh, we also, at the annual meeting, had a section had a session on reboot, rewire, retire, and there's a lot of statistical work as well as the work from Dr. James Center from the Urban Institute and Richard Johnson, and we were happy to have him as a, a speaker. Uh, and some of and that's all available right now on the SOA website, and a lot of it's going to be written up in the forthcoming issues of retirement section news when I get there. <laughs> So you have a great resource right here within your group. <laughs> okay, uh, join me in thanking Dr. James again. Thank you. Uh, this concludes the session, but don't forget to fill your evaluation forms, please.